Thanks, Rob. So I've been coming to this conference now since I think 2014, and uh, I just love the community aspect we have here. Um, you know, very much so like a family, as people have said. And, and one of the things, you know, with that community aspect is, you know, we talk a lot about the ICS problems that we have. And, and, you know, if we see them in the aspect of its fullness, it seems overwhelming. But I think the people in this room have the ability, they have the answers to our, a lot of our problems. And, um, you know, even me being up on stage, if you would have asked me four years ago, four or five years ago, to come up on stage and share something, I probably would have said, I don't really have anything to offer to the community. And, and you know, it's because of folks in this room and, those, and things like that that have really helped shape um, my, me personally. And, and we have that opportunity to give back to the community as we go along. So as the slide shows, my name is Michael Hoffman. I've been in Shell uh, 19 years. Um, <clears throat> couple of major roles in that. I started out actually as an instrumentation electrical technician at a refinery and from then on in I quickly learned that as I was actually up on one of those towers one uh, stormy uh, January afternoon I thought yes there's better jobs out there. Um, so uh, you know, as I couldn't feel my fingers so anyway, so from then on out, I, I continued my journey, uh, did some analyzer work, and then um, in the refinery, went to controls and automation, uh, worked at an asset in uh, Wyoming, uh, where we were doing natural gas extraction, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, back to refinery to do a um, ICS engineer role, and then now in my role currently as the principal uh, ICS engineer for all downstream assets across the globe. So getting into this talk a little bit about log visibility, just a disclaimer, uh, these are my views, these are not Shell's views, don't expect you to um, read this slide, but you know, no matter what. So here about two years ago, you know, all this network visibility equipment came out, and I was, I was like, yes, you know, we, we have to, we got to get this in our plants. I mean, this is a big deal. If you would ask me as an asset owner operator, what are my biggest concerns, they would be, I don't know what's in my environment, right? So when we, we, we put this, this NSM tool out in our plant, and we hooked it up to our core switch, and, and we went, yeah, I can see all this information. And then we started looking at this information like, whoa, what is that traffic? You know, because we, we hadn't looked. And so, so we were looking at this traffic, and, and we noticed, you know, this was substantial um, traffic in our network. And of course, this was at our, you know, L2, 5, L3 type, if you remember the Purdue model. And, and so looking at this over a couple days is like, you know, don't, don't really know what this is. And, and uh, you know, at this time, same time, we have a lot of OPC communication down to our DCS going on and so forth. And so come to find out, this was us doing harm to us. This was a, um, this is a logging tool that we had in our environment. And we are doing WMI decom polling. So every 15 minutes, our log server would go out, scan our systems in our environment, it pulled in the logs, and, and so, you know, we had log visibility, but we were hurting ourselves because we didn't have visibility into our networks. So we kind of, you know, it's a, a big learning curve for us and kind of an aha moment, if you will. So, you know, also with this, we had deployed this IT technology, IT solution in our environments in multiple different plants and, and environments, such as upstream, offshore, um, unconventionals, you know, where we have extreme limited bandwidth capabilities and so forth. So, so with, with that, you know, it was like, you know, it, it was time to take a step back, you know, do self-reflection um, and think, are we doing the best approach? You know, we, we've done good um, with, with some of our solutions, but were we taking the right approach to logging? And so that was, um, you know, one of the, the, you know, the things that I, I began to look at, at, you know, in my role. So, of course, we, you know, as everybody in this room knows, our systems are constrained in the ICS. I mean, that's, that's no, um, no, no brand new news, if you will. So, again, we have lack of available bandwidth. Um, you know, many of our systems, we have 100 meg connections, and, and that's doing pretty good. You know, we also have very remote locations. Um, our ICS networks are not within a fence line. They're not within four walls, a building. You know, we have, uh, you know, again, well pads, offshore locations, pipelines, and so forth. So when you think about putting in an IT tool uh, in these environments, the, that tool has to be able to scale to different architectures, different constraints, and so forth. You know, we also have, of course, vendor restrictions around the software, and rightfully so. Um, you know, we, we tell vendors we want that thing to run 24-7, 365, uptime, availability, 
And then we go knocking on their door and say, you know, hey, we want to run this latest and greatest, you know, software agent on these systems. And, and of course, there's a little bit of pushback. And they'll say, well, that'll maybe avoid, you know, warranties and contracts and all those kind of things. Also, we have a, an issue with, with trying to keep up our operating systems. Um, you know, everybody knows that's a problem. Operating systems are tied to physical hardware and infrastructure. So it's very difficult to, you know, to put in a tool and, and try to baseline it with the operating systems that you have. Um, again, we have deployment constraints, we have maintenance windows to work around and so forth. So it's very difficult to put in some of these systems and so forth when you, know, you have to go reboot every host in your environment, for instance. And then we do have a lot of best practices, if you will, from a higher level perspective. We have you know, the NIST cybersecurity framework, we have the NIST 800 standards, a lot of things that ICS CERT has put out that's excellent material. But when you get from vendor agnostic type best practices, it, they're hard to find. Uh, you know, are there best practices out there for logging and so forth? It's kind of hard to find it, you know, if, it's, if you're being vendor agnostic. So, um, backwards here. So from that aspect, you know, when we look at the logs in the ICS environment, for me, you know, again, you can argue that we have um, SNMP can be, you know, um, added to this as well. But if you think of it, you know, I, I, I consider really two main um, logging uh, types. We have syslog, and again, if you look at a lot of the endpoint devices, our PLCs or our IEDs, RTUs, even analyzers, former analyzer tech, um, a lot of those devices, if you look into them, they have syslog capability. And if they don't, go ask your vendor to put syslog uh, capability in there. Um, and, and definitely, because we need to begin looking into those devices. And of course, you know, network switches, we have routers, firewalls, protocol converters, and so forth, all have syslog capability. You need to be enabling those and looking at that equipment. And then, of course, we have our, our, our NIC systems, and even VMware is a part of that. But for this talk, I really want to concentrate on uh, two different logging aspects, really. So WMI with ECOM pulling, and then also Windows event log forwarding. Now we also have agent-based systems, uh, but again, agent-based is really, that's where we begin to have problems with putting these on our vendor kit, our, our big DCS or SCADIA systems. And, and I know we, you can argue, you know, WMI with DCOM, you can also do WMI with Windows Remote Management, and, and so that's true, but for this, a lot of common deployments I've seen in, in the ICS use DCOM as the choice uh, for communicating across that network. So, uh, you know, um, being very active in SANS, I'm also in the SANS SDI program, and if you have any questions around the master's program, feel free to come uh, get a hold of me, uh, you know, today, and even I'll be here this week taking another class. Um, absolutely love the STI program. Within the STI program, though, you have two opportunities to do research work and to write papers. So one of them was, you know, the first paper I wrote was essentially this talk. It was looking at, at a very real problem that I had in my company and, and wanting to look at ways that I could fix some of that problem. So, so throughout the course of uh, most of this fall, winter time frame, I, I did a lot of research. Uh, wrote this paper, and this is, paper is available in the SANS reading room uh, today if you want to go check that out. So, so with that, um, you know, the next thing I did, so, so I looked at those two logging methods, um, Windows Event Forwarding um, and uh, WMI, and I wanted to test those out from an implementation bandwidth perspective. So first of all, if you, if you see back in those other slides, I, was, I saw a definite bandwidth problem with, um, you know, log pulling with WMI. So, but I wanted to, to compare these two protocols side by side in the lab. So, firstly, in my company, I did have a safe location to test these out. And I wanted to test out the deployment characteristics, again, from the aspect of how would I deploy this, this method in, in an environment so I wouldn't be causing reboots. And, and so I, I wouldn't be, you know, going out and touching every endpoint out there and so forth. Centralized deployment, some of those characteristics I wanted to look at. So, what I did, and I, of course, this is not the Purdue model, this is not IEC 62443 zones and conduits, this is a lab testing out two protocols side by side. So that's all this represents. 
I also was able to use a, a network security monitoring tool to capture the traffic going across the core switch from the, from the same server that was doing WMI pulling and also Windows event forwarding, collecting. So, so with that, I had, um, you know, I used 40 of the same components in, in each, I'm doing each pulling method. Uh, due to some of the way the, the VMware system and so forth was set up on some, how some of the hosts were, were monitoring, um, that NSM product did have visibility to 32 out of the 40 hosts. And for the research work that I was doing, that was plenty of traffic, and, and as you'll see, um, more than enough traffic to do some statistical analysis on it. So with that, moving forward, um, one of the things I wanted to do, though, in this test was set up a, a common logging methodology um, and essentially establish a baseline of the logs collected across that environment. So, of course, I leveraged some of the best practices from the SANS 410 course that Justin talks about. And, and from that, so that, that gives uh, you a good baseline for the, the, uh, the base logging settings in, in Windows. But also, those, and those will generate quite a few logs, if you will, in your environment. But I wanted to really push my system quite a bit, almost to the DOS mode, not quite. Um, but so if you do a little bit of research, the Australian Cybersecurity Center has done a lot of excellent research around log settings and so forth, and they've actually come up with a lot of best practices. I'd be very careful, though, how you would set these up in an ICS environment, because you, um, you, know, you can bring your systems down almost with turning logging up so high. So, so with that, though, um, you know, I pushed down a log GPO across the environment to establish that log baseline to start the research process up. And again, you can look at my white paper. I actually have listed the, the, the GPO I used in this uh, test. So, so with that, I would say, and, and my daughter put this uh, drink from the fire hose image together for me a couple hours before I submitted this, so kudos to her. Um, but anyway, you know, who's taking SANS training to, this week? First of all, show hands. Awesome. You will be um, drinking from the fire hose in those, in those, uh, you know, in those settings. You'll, you will see just a ton of material thrown at you, 700 to 1,000 pages over the, over the course of the next couple days of material. And it just, I mean, it, it feels overwhelmingly awesome. You'll be exhausted, but you can recover. When we crank up logging settings, though, in our environment so high, you know, to almost a debug mode, our systems don't recover from drinking from the fire hose when we push our logs out to our sim. So one of the things in my research I found um, was that um, Don Murdoch, and he is also one, who, uh, one who's been through the STI program, he, he now has a GSC certification, but he wrote this, this book, um, The Blue Team Handbook. And it's, it's one I'd really, really recommend um, that, that folks from a defense standpoint would actually use. And not, you know, and again, this is, he's more IT bent, but this is all things um, defense. And, and so if you want to really look at use cases from the, your SOC team uses and correlate down, that down to actually Windows event IDs, um, Don has done an exceptional job at that. So I uh, completely recommend that you pick up his book, uh, support his efforts and really giving back to the community. Um, you know, just, just an excellent resource. So, so he does go into, Don does do, go into a lot of areas where, you know, you can do that, that correlation between use cases and events. And, and then also there's just a lot of generic uh, best practices in there, in there from a blue team perspective. So with that, of course, when I set up, you know, the, the infrastructure for WMI polling, of course, if you're not familiar with it, WMI is um, client server architecture and so forth. And I do want to step back a little bit. In, in a lot of this discussion, it seems like I'm beating up on WMI quite a bit, and I'm trying not to. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, maybe we're using the wrong tool. And, and I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, understand more about that in a second. But it, of course, it's client server. Um, you know, the mechanism, again, is DCOM over the wire. So, so the server pulls the logs. Uh, it goes and requests logs with, a, with the DCOM. And then the logs get pulled back. So anyway, so you have this constant pull, essentially a request for logs on the environment. The endpoints will give you logs if they have them. So, so if, you're, if you're requesting logs all, all the time, so, so let's say you want to turn up your resolution so that your, your WMI log uh, polling server will essentially be contacting all those endpoints at, at whatever frequency you set to get those logs back in your environment. 
And again, ultimately, to get those logs pushed out to your SIM so your SOC teams can look at them, whether it's an IT or an ITOT split or an OT SOC team. So, so again, you're, you're leveraging um, multiple protocols here. You got DCOM across the wire for, for that, that communication. It's, it's, it's hitting WMI to get access to your event logs. So you actually have three different settings here with WMI. So some of the considerations across WMI when I was setting it up. So when you're, when you're doing this, and again, I've, I've had quite a bit of experience from an administrative perspective. So I like to do things centrally, push things out with group policies and so forth. When you do that with a group policy, you can easily set up DCOM permissions. You can set up your event log reader permissions. But you get down to WMI and it's nowhere to be found. So when you look at the permissions aspect from WMI, um, a, a lot of people, they, they hit this stage and they, they throw up their hands. And then they, get, they take their nice uh, restricted service account, plug it into the domain admins group, and all of a sudden it works. And of course it works. You now have your service account having domain admin privileges across your environment. Uh, that didn't work for me. So, I, I, so there, you know, through a couple different tools, and I talk about this in my paper, I was able to script this out from, and from one place, uh, enable restricted um, access to my uh, WMI uh, provider settings, and, and, and try to, you know, uh, do a principal release privilege type access into that. So I would say, you know, and, and I think it's a good takeaway for all of us. When we get to a place where we want to um, punt and do the easy thing, I, I think we've got to be very careful in that and really look at, you know, what is the end goal of this? Is it, you know, we want to be more secure, we want to have endpoint visibility and so forth, but are we doing so at a risk to our systems and to a risk of security? So over six days, and I thought this was quite interesting. Now, I, here I'm using the Nozomi appliance. And, and again, um, we have that running in our lab. And the appliance does an excellent job of really digging down into the protocol level. So I, here I could have also used Wireshark. But Wireshark doesn't have the, as nice filtering capabilities. And spinning up Wireshark for six days would be quite problematic. Um, so anyway, other, other vendors out here in, in, the, in the hallway can do the same thing. Uh, I just had Nozomi in my hand, so great tool for this. I wrote a custom query to actually pull these out. But if you look at that, the sum of the bandwidth for 32 hosts in the environment was 17 gig of logs. And again, that was, that's with advanced audit settings fairly hijacked up, but not all the way. So you can see how much traffic in your environment. And again, this is a lab environment. This isn't a... Um, you know, this isn't a production environment where you have a lot of logins and those kind of things, a lot of surface accounts spinning up and so forth. But what this does show is that, that logging alone can cause a lot of traffic in your environments. So one of the things with WMID com pulling, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the connection counts were fairly stable with this. And, and when you consider that, you have, you know, essentially a, a polling server connecting out to your environment at a very, very you know, high frequency and so forth. So your connection counts on, uh, between that server client and back will be fairly stable across. Now, the packet size, though, in this is not stable. And, and I had to, in, these, in these graphs, I had to scrub out some of the, um, the host names and IP addresses and so forth, of course. But the, you know, the, essentially, the top three systems were my domain controllers. And of course, in a domain environment, those are getting hit with, with most of the you know, lo logins and from the service account, from uh, computer accounts, and user accounts, and so forth. So they're going to have the most logs. But interestingly enough, when you look at this from a perspective of, you know, for my packet size, for network utilization, so, so here, you know, essentially, the, the systems with getting hit the most um, were actually the ones that had you know, data in their packets able to be moved back and forth across the network. So that tells me, though, is that systems that, you know, and again, this is only the top 10 hosts, but systems that don't have uh, logs to push across the network are really not being utilized well. What that means is, is systems in your ICS environment with no logs, they're just chewing up bandwidth as they're getting communicated to back and forth trying to get logs out of them. So next was to move over to Windows event forwarding. <clears throat> now, Windows event forwarding is bleeding edge. No, not really. Windows event forwarding has been out since, out, out since 2008 or Vista. So 
but, but what's interesting, Leon, though, is that even in, in uh, IT space, not a whole lot of people have been implementing it right now. Um, you, you don't, but but um, in the last couple of years, like folks like the NSA, again, Australian Cybersecurity Center, um, other folks have put out some very, very good papers on uh, using event forwarding. And I'll, we'll get into some of the details here in a minute. I would say in a domain environment, it's very easy to deploy. But, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Easy for one person is difficult for somebody else. If you're, if you're uh, familiar with domains, group policy objects, and so forth, it's quite easy. Um, but again, um, you know, it, it all depends on, on uh, who's doing this and so forth. But it, it is a little bit more challenging, though, when we look at deploying this across domains or if you have across work groups. A lot of times in our ICS environments, we have multiple domains in your systems. So, so this is easy to deploy when you have a domain environment, um, but if you go across domains, you again, you have to pull in certificates and so forth. One thing, what is really nice about it is you're using built-in Windows components. So your logs are being um, pushed across using Kerberos for authentication and your logs are encrypted. It's kind of a nice uh, thing to have. You can also set this up in a push or a pull configuration. So, and, you know, so for, I would say, 99% of the use cases, you'd want to push your logs from your endpoints out to your collector server. Um, but you do have the option, and it is a little bit easier to deploy if you're actually pulling your logs. So essentially, you're just setting your, your collector server to go out and collect all these computers, and you're giving it the access permissions and so forth, and it goes out and collects those logs. But, but I'll show in a minute here, you probably don't want to be doing that. You can also create multiple subscriptions. So you can create a baseline, baseline subscription in your environment, or you can chop it up. You can have subscriptions for your, your uh, different servers or different systems that are getting hit harder than others. Um, and, and to do so, why you'd want to do that is to really tailor your logging settings. And so you may want to crank up your log settings on, on your terminal servers, remote access servers, and so forth, and crank down on them and some of the other ones in your environment. And you can also chain these collector servers together. So let's say in your, your architecture you have, you know, different, uh, you know, you have different domains. And so each of the domains you can have a collector server and then you can go, um, those, each collector servers can forward up to a centralized collector server. And then from that server it can forward on out to your SIM. So from a high level setup uh, on event forwarding, First thing you have to do is you have to enable Windows Remote Management. And this is also the same piece as PowerShell uses for remoting. So, so when you think about this, you're, here you're now en enabling, uh, if you will, PowerShell remoting, which is a good thing if it's locked down properly. But it does use that, that same functionality. So first thing you do is you have to go out and enable um, that WinRM and do a quick config on it. Now, that sets up WinRM with a um, default settings, and you'll, you will need to go lock those down with a group policy. After that, of course, you create the, the Windows Event Collector service on the server, and that's as simple as, as going on, on, that, on the server environment. You click on the subscriptions, pops up and says, hey, do you want to start up the service? You say yes. And then you go through a reboot cycle, and now that computer, whatever it was, is now acting as a collector. From then on out, you create a group policy object. And in that group policy object, you set up your sitting settings to lock down Windows Remote, who has access into, those, um, into your endpoints with PowerShell remoting and so forth. And you also set up access for, um, for uh, who the collector server is and so forth. With that, you, you can create the subscriptions in your collector server and then, of course, forwarding on. So I also get asked you know, once in a while, where should I put my syslog server at? Because again, our two logging um, protocols we're normally using, or not protocols, but the log types are syslog and, and Windows, um, Windows logs. So putting a, you know, a syslog server on that WEX server is also a good idea, I think. And one thing to note too is here you're getting all of your logs out of your environment and you didn't have to put, you know, go to any other vendor and get tooling for this. It's all done internally. So you now have a way of getting your logs, getting that endpoint visibility, um, 
not having to go out and, and purchase anything else, and just from a little bit of configuration on the Windows side. And we'll, we'll also you know, discuss here that from the communication aspect and, and firewalls. So you know, we, we've struggled a lot in the past with firewalls, and especially with DCOM. So, so DCOM, as most of you know, is also OPC DA. It's OPC class communication. So I, I would almost um, say that everyone in this room is running uh, D, you know, DCOM, DEC RPC protocol, and those kind of things. But with this, you can really lock down your firewall rules for logging. Um, you know, when, when you look at the generic setting, which is HTTP, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, that's HTTP from the out, outlier of the, of the transport protocol, but when you look at, um, when you start to take that packet apart, that's just, um, just the frame of it. And then when you dig into it, it's actually an, an encrypted communication. And again, that's, that's one port, it's one direction, it's very simple to set up the firewall rules in this environment for logging. So on the subscription settings, <clears throat> I get asked quite a bit, so where are these at in Windows? And, and very much so, so again, to, to set up a uh, subscription, give me a second here. So to set up a subscription, you, you, you go to that field <clears throat> in Windows, you right click on that and you say new subscription. And in that you have a, a couple options here. <clears throat> And you know, again, you can set up a one subscription as a baseline subscription across your environment, or you can chop this up and again, have multiple subscriptions targeted to multiple different types of systems. Now with this, from the, and let me go back here, from here you have essentially three different options when you set up your subscriptions as well. You have your groups or what computers you're, you're um, is in the subscription is being included. You also have your events to collect, and that's a filtering area. We'll get into that a little bit more. And then your advanced settings on your subscription. So when you get into the, the uh, computer groups, if you're doing a baseline subscription, you have the ability to, to go into the, your domain, select each individual computer you want, and add them in. Now, if you have a large domain, that might not be the most uh, efficient method. But if you, um, if you look at, and you can do this, and I'm showing it here, if you look at the domain computers and the domain controllers group in your environment, those two objects um, hold all computers in your environment. So just by selecting these two objects, and again, going back with that group policy, which told my, those computers in the environment, which collector served to point to, I'm essentially now looking at all the computers in the environment, or they're all getting subscribed to. So with that, you now go into select events and, and on the advanced tab. Now with select events, you do have the option in here um, to really uh, pull down and, and um, optimize essentially the events you, uh, that you are looking for in your environment. And again, I, I've asked people before, what logs do you want? And a common response is, well, give me all your logs. And that, that always doesn't work. So here's a good spot to really work with your SOC teams and, and come up and say, okay, what use cases are you running? And again, this is, helps out with that ITOT convergence aspect of the OT side really working with the IST side and, and coming together on you know, use cases and so forth. That's just an excellent you know, first, first take in that. But again, from here, you can really narrow down which events you want, plug them in here to your use cases. So that's where you can have multiple different types of subscriptions for use cases. Here, what I'm doing, and again, just because of the test, I'm selecting the security log. But, but you could also create another subscription maybe for your, um, you know, your hardware logs and so forth. Look at it, startups and those kind of things. Also here, you have uh, delivery options for, for the subscription. Now, you, you also have um, another field not shown, of course, but it's customized, it's grayed out, but you can, uh, and again, all this stuff is accessed through PowerShell as well. So you can, you can build up this with a PowerShell XML script and, and then dump this into your environment and set up all your subscriptions that way. But of course, from the, from the user inter interface perspective, this is kind of how it goes. Now, from the delivery optimization, normal is essentially setting the subscription to a 15-minute timeout with five logs. 
So that's your threshold. If you want to go faster than that, you can go minimize latency, and that's every 30 seconds. Uh, might not be the best for this environment. Minimize bandwidth is six hours, so it's kind of taking it to the other extreme. Um, and then, of course, you see the protocol here is HTTP. That, that is, um, that's at port 5985, uh, still Kerberos uh, authentication, and it's encrypted data packet. So again, you do have a lot of settings um, on, on the event subscriptions and so forth. And again, you can also go to that customized field and customized out you know, your heartbeat interval, how often this checks in. Um, you know, if you wanted, you know, maybe 15 minutes is too long, maybe you want to go 10 minutes or 60 minutes, it's up to you. But it's really how often do you want those logs to get, get into your environment and, you know, from a visibility perspective. So again, so setting this, this um, my, the lab up with, with uh, Windows Event Forwarding with push, you know, essentially, um, when you look at it, the logs just trickle in, and, and that's kind of what I saw. It's just each system, it's after it, it gets timed out or fill, if it fills up with logs, it just pours its logs out. And so it's a very, very efficient method of, get, of getting your logs out. And again, looking at uh, from the normal perspective on that subscription, uh, that five log batch with the 15 minute timeout, I thought worked pretty good. And that's what I, I used initially in the testing here. So. When I was pitting both of these two logging methods together, I used absolutely default uh, settings because I didn't want to influence the, the test with it. So again, when you look at the statistics over seven days, it was, it was quite shocking to me. So, so the visibility that this my Nozomi appliance had with 32 hosts was 10 gig. So that's a 40% reduction in bandwidth in my environment, um, which is substantial. And, and again, further, um, you know, if I would have modified my subscription down uh, to a couple, a couple of different uh, settings, I'm sure I could have gotten that a lot more. And after I did all my research as well, it, um, with event forwarding, it does allow you also to, um, to, to actually transmit your logs in a binary format versus, a, um, versus an ASCII type format, if you will, and you can further uh, compress your logs. So something to just think into as you get into this a little bit more. So again, one thing also, came clear to me is that uh, the connection count. So this is, again, these are the domain controllers in the environment, and then these are the rest of the servers. And, and of course, I've got workstations here. If you'd see this, they just taper off. But the connections on this were really for the, the top log generators in the environment. It had the highest number of connection counts, which is about which what you'd think. But here, the packet size was interesting to me as well, though. The, the, the packet size stayed fairly consistent. The, it, was, it was utilizing the network efficiently. And, and, and again, the, only the systems that had logs were pushing those out that are utilizing the network resources. So from that, you know, I, I think one of the key takeaways in this is that you know, we really need to look at and, 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 re, and do a little bit of reflection on what are we doing to ourselves with our security tooling. Are we, you know, are, are we doing, for the sake of security, are we hurting our plant environments? Or are we putting those systems in place that are, are helping out security, helping out integrity and uptime and availability and so forth? Because if we're putting systems in our environment in the name of, in the name of um, security that are causing network disturbances, that are dropping packets, which are losing OPC communication, all those things, we, we've lost, we, we've failed. If, from my aspect of an asset owner who's charged with keeping our plants running 24-7. Another thing too is now, you know, for me, and, and this is a big thing in, in my company, is, is looking at Windows Event Forwarding and, and thinking, you know, this is really where we need to take it to the next step. And so the, those systems that can support it, you know, my recommendation to you is, is at least look into this. Um, definitely, as, as you're having logging challenges and so forth, look into this uh, tooling. And again, it's, it's all Windows. Don't have to go out and buy anything else. If you would, if you would implement this in your environment, definitely would want to uh, you know, use push configuration. It's a little bit more on the, on the group policy settings and those kind of things, but well worth it in the end. I would also look at modifying the subscription latency settings for your environment. Maybe you have that brand new plant out there with 10 gig back, 10 to 40 gig backbones, who knows, and, and can handle just, just pumping everything through it, no problem. But, but for most of us who have legacy equipment, 
definitely we have to look at our network bandwidth and so forth. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be gained in modifying a lot of the default settings. I also think we have a lot more um, that we can do with our, uh, you know, with, with working with our SOC teams on, on the SIM platforms and so forth to modify actually the, the logs that, that we need uh, to get that visibility that we, you know, that we desire. And I also want to say, too, from an aspect of what happens if our collector server crashes? Where, what, what happens to the logs? Well, you have endpoint logs out there in, in your, all your endpoints. So your endpoints are still acting as a log buffer. And so the minute that, you know, that, that collector server stands back up, those endpoints will eventually reach back out to it, begin to communicate, and begin to forward logs again. So you already have a buffered log configuration, which I know is important to, you know, except folks and others that have to have logs, you know, you, you can't have a log outage. Um, yeah, so, so with that, you know, d definitely let, let's help each other out. This was an aspect when I looked into the to logging, you know, the, the, there was some people looking into this, but not a whole lot of people knew about it. And, and for me, and, and, and looking at, you know, some of the aspects in, in you know, my company was one of those areas that definitely, um, you know, we need to get better about. But also, I, you know, I think that we as a community probably needs to do a little bit better job here as well. And also, again, just take that aspect of, you know, what you're doing out in your company, just to conclude here, um, you may think it, it may be trivial, but it may be that thing that somebody else is really struggling with. So I'd encourage you, again, just to look at, at some of the things that you're working through, some of the challenges that you have, and really bring them up to the community and share with others. Because again, your, the thing, that small challenge that you may have just tackled could be somebody, somebody else's stumbling block, and they really need your help with. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much.